And do you have any original ideas, or are you just constantly recycling old scripts? Well, if that ain't the pot calling the kettle a bitch. Hey folks, Scott Kaisenek of Rarix here, and I'm finally able to make another one of these. Between X Minutes, Hiffle, and miscellaneous other projects, I've been too busy to edit them myself. So I have finally bitten the bullet and acquired another editor. That's right, dogs can pet other dogs. But why the Chip and Dale movie? Well, ever since the announcement, I've been intrigued. Because like many of you watching this video, I grew up with the Disney afternoon. Gummy Bears, DuckTales, Goof Troop, Bonkers, Darkwing Duck, Tailspin, Aladdin, Gargoyles, <laughs> Mighty Ducks. I have always had a soft spot for these characters. And while DuckTales 2017 certainly gave us hits of that sweet, sweet nostalgia, they were merely appetizers for us hungry to see real full-blown reboots of these classic shows. So many of us were psyched to see these two gumshoes pick up the slack. But to our surprise, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers 2022 is neither a reboot nor a continuation of the original series in the traditional sense, but is instead a meta-narrative that reimagines the animated series as an actual filmed television show, in a world where toons from numerous franchises coexist with humans. And not just Disney stable, either. So upon the first trailer's release, the Roger Rabbit comparisons were quick, and the response was polarized. Fans of the original 1989 animated series were stoked at the idea of a modern-day adaptation, but were then disappointed and even angry to find out that Disney had other plans. Others, like myself, have just become exhausted with the endless deluge of high-profile content coming up primarily focused around meta-commentary and showcasing intellectual properties. On the flip side, there were, and still are, plenty of folks who are excited to see characters they know crossing over, who are in it for the biting software commentary on the industry, and entertaining in-jokes about the medium of animation. For me, I was excited to see what they could do with the classic Rescue Rangers, so I too was initially disappointed by their decision. But in retrospect, I think Disney just doesn't consider Rescue Rangers as its own genuine property to be marketable to kids in the modern day. Sure, this film targets nostalgic adults, but they made sure to keep the film family-friendly for the brand. And modern-day kids probably aren't gaga for Rescue Rangers. My guess is that this was most likely the only way it was going to happen, at least with Disney's modern model. The major issue I found was just how tired I've become of major studios creating showcases for their properties. It feels like Shrek helped start the modern movement of self-aware animation and film, and Wreck-It Ralph took it to another level by bringing high-profile characters from multiple franchises into the mix. And while it was exciting and fresh to see this back in 2001 and 2012 respectively, it's starting to feel like we've lost the plot here. Literally. Ready Player One, Wreck-It Ralph 2, and Space Jam 2 are the worst offenders of the bunch, either sightlighting their plots to fill the screen with popular characters or constructing shallow plots whole cloth around them. After a non-stop cameo barrage these last several years, it just feels like the novelty's worn off. That inner Smash Brothers player in me that loved the idea of seeing his favorite action figures from different series bang up against each other has started to become numb to it. But let's put that on hold for now and talk about whether or not the film itself manages to pull off this feat in a fresh and invigorating way, or if it drowns in the sewage water of its own capitalist ambition. First, the acting. I've heard a lot of negative feedback regarding the performances in this film, but there were only a few glaring exceptions that really dragged it down for me. Kiki Lane struggles a bit as Ellie, giving the most stilted performance here. I'm sure part of that comes down to the nature of the production, not having physical actors to perform off of. Andy Samberg as Dale is also a mixed bag. Sometimes he's charismatic and a lot of fun. In other scenes, he has trouble fully emoting and bringing up the energy. John Mulaney is actually giving a solid performance here as Chip. There's so much more nuance and sincerity than you'd expect that it's almost jarring. I think the director was aiming for a down-to-earth portrayal for both Chip and Dale. Unfortunately, it sometimes ends up making their performances either clash with the tone or feel boring. Although, side note, while John Mulaney and Andy Samberg wouldn't be my first picks to voice Chip and Dale, I'm personally glad we didn't get an entire film of this. You'd rather just give up? No. I know a lot of folks are upset that they changed the voices, but I just don't know if I could have sat there an hour and a half of that. It reminds me of the people who are upset that Charles Martinet is not voicing Mario in the upcoming Mario movie. 
Yes, Chris Pratt is a terrible choice for a host of reasons, but I just don't think that Mr. Martinet's interpretation could carry the character for an entire film without the character's speaking role being trimmed down significantly. Will Arnett as Sweet Pete kind of feels like he's phoning it in, but it's Will Arnett, so it's still pretty solid. But the standout here is easily J.K. Simmons, who's just eating up his role as the police chief. The little noises he makes while jumping around, morphing his body, and his full embrace of being a sleazy little clay gremlin are a treat. Stop him, Captain! You're better than this! No, I'm not! Tress McNeil also returns as Gadget, the Allstate guy provides Zip with actual dialogue, and Eric Bana is Monterey Jack, which is frankly confusing because Jim Cummings is in the movie. Like, why? Nobody cares that Eric Bana is Monterey Jack. Just use Jim Cummings or Peter Cullen. Seth Rogen? You were also here. But of course, even a groundbreaking performance can't save a bad script. And this, well, I don't know if I would call it bad, but I would call it uneven, cynical, and insincere. And its best is often overshadowed by its worst. I actually appreciate the setup of Dale ruining the original show's run by leaving to start his own career because he felt overshadowed and underappreciated in his role, only to fail, halting both their careers. And the instigating event to bring them back together, Monterey Jack being kidnapped by the Mafia for unpaid cheese debt, is a perfect way to start a mystery for them to uncover, and lead them through a city full of literally colorful characters and life-threatening danger. I also have to admit that there are a lot of fun references throughout that nerds like myself will get a chuckle at. I'm not so jaded that I can't enjoy any of its callbacks and character pulls, when they feel relevant, and Lego Miserable is too real in the best way. The premise is also genuinely helped by the fact that, somehow, they were not restricted to Disney-owned properties. Plenty of other characters and references to other characters from other companies appear all over, making the world feel more fleshed out by not limiting it to one corporation's catalog. And there are some genuinely well-written exchanges, my favorite being this line from Sweet Pete. I always like money. It's a shame what happened. Too much cheese, not enough bread. And finally, the premise of a bootlegging operation, kidnapping animated celebrities and turning them into low-rate mockbuster rip-offs, is legitimately inspired and may be the most ingenious choice in the film. Also, side note, they made Dale a stripper. I don't know what to do with this information, I just couldn't leave it unsaid. But the first notable issue we run into comes down to how dark and miserable everything feels. Who Framed Roger Rabbit walked that tightrope? Embracing the criminal underbelly that plagued Hollywood, and thus Toontown, and playing with all the sordid trappings of a classic noir story. But it always found a way to bring you back to laughter and optimism, to make a joke of it, even in its darkest moments. Here, the film spends a lot of time emphasizing just how depressing, corrupt, and hyper-capitalistic the industry is, while never offering anything hopeful, optimistic, or funny enough to make it all feel palatable. Which, let me be clear, could work. I'm not above a cynical, realistic deconstruction of my nostalgia. But the film can't commit to that. It wants you to laugh and feel good about these two chipmunks teaming back up together and repairing their friendship while taking down the bad guys and saving the day. And it wants you to clap and holler when classic characters from other franchises make appearances for a split second because what we really needed was big mouth characters and Randy Marsh and Asano with the three little pigs lamenting losing their children in divorce while Peter Pan kidnaps and mutilates your childhood favorites aided by the corrupt LAPD in a system that crushes dreams and wrings your childhood memories for every rose-tinted scent. Oh, and by the way, Sweet Pete's backstory is strikingly close to the story of Bobby Driscoll, the original actor for Peter Pan who, after he got older, couldn't make it in the industry and ended up turning to heroin before dying penniless. Meaning, they took a real man's tragic story, of which Disney was personally involved in, applied it to the character of Peter Pan for this film, and then made him the villain. Like, holy shit! Also, if Peter is aging, why isn't he, like, in his 80s? And why does only he age but none of the other tunes seem to? And how are so many high-profile characters going missing and showing up as bootlegs, yet there isn't a giant industry-wide crackdown happening? I understand that this might come off as nitpicking, but potholes are like potholes. The small ones are easy enough to ignore, but the big ones will ruin your suspension of disbelief. Beyond that, the film often relies on a writing trick that grew old almost as soon as it became common in the industry. 
pointing out a flaw in the writing while still doing it anyway. As if being self-aware of it makes it better, or even acceptable. It wants to keep its stinky cheese, but eat it too. This film is not the worst offender in that regard, but these jokes are still prominent enough to drag it down. And it feels as if a sizable chunk of the script is just them banking on references to make up for a lack of real humor and engagement. While some of its pulls are clever and entertaining, most of them are just, hey, remember this character? Yeah, they're in the movie. And that's it. Many of the jokes here that aren't direct references also feel dated. The Uncanny Valley is a legitimately solid joke in 2012. Here, it works, but the film treats it as more clever than it really is. It's made worse by how the film makes all these jokes about the animation, but never once, once, recognizes that its principal cast of 2D animated characters aren't actually animated in 2D. Almost every named 2D character is actually a 3D model using cell shading to mimic traditional 2D animation. Sometimes it works, other times it really doesn't. So to hear Dale declare that he got the CGI surgery done has an added layer of unintentional irony. Like, you're really gonna take shots at the Uncanny Valley when you got a character walking around looking like this? What is wrong with you? What? It's my job. In a film that has been lauded as a love letter to animation and the industry, it just feels remarkably insincere to portray the medium of traditional 2D animation with cel-shaded CG. This is made all the more frustrating by the quality of the traditional CG work on display, as well as the overall quality of the filmmaking throughout. Miniature sets are created for the smaller characters, requiring some tricky camera work, and the compositing is top notch. It's crazy how good the 3D characters look and how well they fit into the environment. I mean, look at this, bro. I want a whole movie about DJ Herzogenrak. Um, um, it's DJ Herzogenrak with the Disney Afternoon Remix. But the major thing I haven't touched much on is whether or not this film is good for fans of the original Rescue Rangers and whether or not it's supposed to be. Because frankly, the film does a poor job at honoring the original series. While it does make mention of a couple canonical episodes, there's a ton of merch on display in Dale's garage, and there are musical references throughout, the film doesn't feel like it has any real reverence for the show. Rather, it just feels like a vehicle for the director and writers to make a spiritual successor to Roger Rabbit. This is made prevalent by the lack of the main crew being involved for most of the runtime, and how they constantly reference episodes that don't actually exist which really bothers me because they had 60 plus episodes to pull from. Making up new non-existent episodes for the sake of making the same point about pulling ideas from the original show over and over feels lazy and dismissive of the fans. Like all its praise and veneration of the show are lip service. And truth be told, I'm not certain the film would have been better if it had been more focused on the original cast and had been more faithful to the source material. All I know is that its use of this property in this movie feels tertiary as if Rescue Rangers just happened to fall into the Goldilocks zone of nostalgic and exploitable while not being too obscure like Bonkers, who, mysteriously, doesn't show up in this film. A film about the Disney afternoon, crime, and the police. Well, maybe it's for the best. To be clear, I'm still not certain I would call the film bad. Hell, if I had to compare it to, say, Space Jam 2, I'd actually recommend this over that. I found more here to entertain and engage me, and it genuinely feels like less of a commercial. I mean, it's definitely still a commercial, but less. But it is a frustrating watch, because for every solid joke and clever reference, there's something lazy, cynical, insincere, and or exploitative. At its best, it's a moderately funny, mostly well-crafted collection of animation in-jokes and nostalgic pulls. At its worst, it's a carousel of cameos masquerading as a movie, Disney's vision of the future of capital C content, where the worst thing to worry about is someone, somewhere, violating the House of Mouse's IP. Oh hey, there's Bonkers! Oh, and Ugly Sonic is in the movie. I laughed. Obligatory statement complete.